I had no self-esteem, very little self-confidence. But if you looked at me from the outside, I looked like I was the biggest go-getter out there. Are you the overachiever who's out there burning those candles on both ends? Are you that overachiever that strives for more? And every day, you're up at that crack of dawn, driving, 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 driving. And you've gotten to that part of the hedonic treadmill, that place where you keep on running for more, but you really quite never get enough. You know, it's another car. It's a bigger house. It's a bigger financial debt. But you've got to do more. But inside, there's a crack. You're not taking care of the inside. Now, the outside looks great. It's a great veneer. Is that you? You know, part of being unstoppable is knowing that you have to take care of yourself from the inside out. Today, my very special guest, all the way from France, Dr. Dreema Dial, is going to tell you how she is unstoppable. Yes, don't change that dial. Welcome to the Unstoppables, and welcome, Dreema, to the show. Thank you, Bill, for having me here. I cannot wait to talk about my journey and to find out more about yours. You know, I don't think that there, there are any of us who are what we call overachievers who haven't felt or don't feel that burn inside, that void. And sometimes, you know, you know Dr. Dream, uh, the, people will come to me and say, Bill, I've made a lot of money, but where's my happiness? What would you, right. say, what would you say to that person? I would say, where is your happiness? It's going to start from inside. It starts inside all of us. And unfortunately, in our culture, we have this idea that success is defined by the exterior, by the material, by the bigger house, the bigger car, getting the plane. Those things are fabulous, but they don't fill this place in here. And I think that's what a lot of overachievers have tried to do. I know I did it myself. I had no self-esteem, very little self-confidence. But if you looked at me from the outside, I looked like I was the biggest go-getter out there. But I always felt there was something missing, something inside of me that just wasn't quite right. You know, that imposter thing, like, mm. yeah, I, I've done these things and achieved these things, but do I deserve them? Yes. And why do I feel guilty all the time? That's the million dollar question for me, is yeah, that, what's going on for you inside? That imposter syndrome is real. It <laughs> is real. Am I worthy of the, of the success I have? Am I, and I think the, the insightful and the enlightened question that on their journey. Uh, yeah. I'm listening for this, but you went to Texas, University of Texas, hook em horns, correct? All right. Are you from Texas? No, my dad was in the military, so I grew up moving around all over and then landed in Texas uh, with my now ex-husband and my two little kids and just wound up staying there for another 20 years. Got my doctorate, did the whole thing, but such a journey, you know, I didn't start out there. I started out working in retail, working in fashion. I was all about the superficial and the exterior, all about that. And one day this woman came in and she, she dropped several thousand dollars on a wardrobe, which she did routinely. And I thought, I can't do this anymore. I'm making people happy on the outside, but once those price tags come off, they're left with themselves. Great point. I don't want to do retail therapy anymore. And that's when I decided to go back to school and become a psychologist. That's a great point. Now, I took a bunch of clients to Cabo San Lucas and one of the clients asked me, and this was taboo. No one in my company was supposed to discuss my financial situation. But the client said, why do you have two of these same kind of expensive Italian cars? And my answer was, I must have really been unhappy. Yeah, <laughs> so, there you go. <laughs> it, was dis- it was a disarming uh, statement. I want to I want to start with school because I told you I would get to this. I am a dilettante when it comes to psychology. Uh, and I'll tell you why. You know, I went on this search for me and I thought psychology is where I want to be because I want to help people. I want to understand myself. And you know, when you read your first psych book, everything is about you in there. You know, you see the reaction. <laughs> this is all about me. And, and then I sat through at Purdue University, I sat through a an experimental psych class where rats had to run through this maze. And then they taught us that if rats were in a cylinder, that eventually they would give up and drown. And that's when I thought, you know what? I don't really know if psychology is for me. This kind of just 
doesn't make sense anymore. So how did you get through that? And, and what, there's my story. So that's why I have just a little bit. We already, we already talked about my French experience where I had such a beautiful teacher, I couldn't learn the language. And right. France. Two questions, two questions you can wrap into one. Take your 30,000 foot background of starting out, getting in from retail, getting into psychology, and then you're in France. Take me there. Yeah. Okay. So I love psychology. Now, initially, I did think it was going to be a bunch of rats running around, but I started in language studies and psychology, and I loved it. And then I thought, you know what? I want to find out more about what makes people tick. And so I got my doctorate and along the way just fell in love with the idea of transformation. And then in my practice, seeing people change was just so humbling to be a part of this experience. My partner and I love to travel, however, and so I was limited by the idea that I, you know, I can't take off a month when you're seeing people in person like that. But what I discovered was, hey, if I'm gone for a couple of weeks, I can work part of that time. Now, what I didn't realize at the time was I was actually training my clients to accept the fact that I could work with them long distance. But along the way, I started feeling this sense of liberation and this idea that I wanted to reach more people. I loved my psychology practice, but I was limited by the amount of, of hours I could put my butt in the chair every day. And that grew to be not enough. And so because we love to travel, because I wanted to do something bigger, I thought, I'm going to transition into life coaching, and I can do that from anywhere in the world. And that's when we said, okay, this may be crazy, but let's sell everything we have and move to France. And we did. And I'll tell you what, my colleagues were like, you've got to be crazy. You're going to give up a successful practice. You're going to sell everything you have, and you're going to move to a country Ah, you're crazy. And I did feel a little bit crazy, but you know what? That passion, when you light on something that you know in your heart is right, you don't stop. You don't listen to other people. You move forward and you trust yourself. And that's exactly what we did. So now I have been here almost three years. I absolutely love it. And I've had the opportunity to work with so many more people in different capacities, in groups, working with them one-on-one -on -one for coaching. And it's been just so wonderful. Just such a, I didn't realize I was going to be this happy. I was happy before. I wasn't coming from a place of unhappiness, but this idea that I could be happier, I could do more of what I love, just really there's nothing like it, is it? There's just nothing like it. I'm going to give it a salute out to the head of Fox Business International, who's one of the, if not the top interviewers I've ever experienced in my life. His name is Vip Jaswell. Hi, Vip. I'll tell you what he would do as a technique right now. Hmm. And pause. And let you just keep talking. <laughs> and he'll, he'll introduce you to the devil at the next level. <laughs> Did you just walk into the maze, just like those rats? <laughs> and you're trapped. You know, you just mentioned the part of always forward. For me, it's about burning your boat. So when you left for something different, there's a comfort of the known. And people crave, yes. as you know, in their life. They crave that certainty. But they also, have, they also need something that makes them a bit uncomfortable, even though they don't want to be exposed. You right. need to kind of jump on that boat of opportunity that's leaving every day. You know, mm -hmm. or, or you stay on the dock. So, you know, mix, you know and, and I just don't want to live my life playing it forward in a place where I'm now at a stage where I can't do at a certain time what I can do right now. That's called regret for me. I, don't yeah. know that. I want you to, to do the tough lifting here. Give me a heavy lift. There are a plethora, a myriad, and any other word you want to use is exponential, amount of people who dress themselves up, mostly imposters, as a life coach, it makes my skin crawl because how are they qualified to be a life coach? So you tell me how you're qualified to be a life coach. Well, I'll tell you what, getting a doctorate is no small feat. That took seven years and that was seven straight years. That takes discipline, it takes motivation and it takes dedication. 
So I know my stuff. I come from the scientific background, but I've also got the experience in terms of living life. My life has had a lot of ups and downs. It's had a lot of challenges and I've learned from those. And in transitioning to becoming a life coach, I'm not just about rah, rah, ha, ha, we're going to make your life look mine. I want to know what your dream is. And so I always talk about this as being science meets strategy because I'm not coming from some woo-woo place. I'm not coming from a, well, I lost 20 pounds, so now I'm going to be a life coach and tell people how to lose weight too. I'm coming from a place of knowledge, a place of education, a place of experience. And if I don't have an answer for you, I'm willing to tell you, I don't know, and I'm going to find out. So there's something about tenacity that just really gets me when I start work with somebody. You just won my heart because <laughs> definitely something about honesty. I've always said honesty is disarming. And to say in leadership, which I do in my stage talks, one of the most powerful things you can say is I don't know. Yeah. When you presuppose to know, number one, you're going to be, you have to have credibility. If you don't, you're caught out as a fraud. And when I've made the impulse move to try to look invulnerable, I've lost money. Yeah. Get off, push back, say you don't know, if you don't know, you don't know. Find the resources to, that can help you. Again, mm -hmm. you might not know. I'll tell you something else that won my heart with you. If you can make those big sales in retail, $2,000 sales, and actually have that human compassion to say, you know what, I, I, I'm filling a bill here, I'm making some money, but this person isn't getting what, they're just going to keep buying, but never really find something inside. That's an aha moment. That's awareness. That's a light. You have yeah. an obligation to do something about that. And that is why I would let you coach me. All right, then. I All I right, then. Might, I don't know if you would. Your price would be pretty high because I'm a pretty crazy guy. But, you know, <laughs> <Right>. wild, <laughs> too. But, well, you know, that's why my tenacity works in my favor. Paint a picture for me. Uh, that will make you singularly significant that, that I would come to you. So give me your ideal client. Who, what's your ideal client look like? You know, my ideal client is somebody who has really achieved a lot. And I love that because that shows me that they've got a lot of drive. They've got a lot of intellect. They've got a lot of passion. Mm -hmm. And what I find with most of these people, not all, but most is that inner peace, that inner work, hasn't been done because they've been so focused on getting ahead, on getting that promotion, on setting up that business. And they've achieved this great success, but they're not feeling it. Those are the people that I work with best because I know that place of emptiness. I know how to get in there. And quite frankly, your achievements and your accomplishments don't put me off at that point. I'm not intimidated by that. Been there, done that. So when you come to me, I don't care who you are, CEO, billionaire, when you come to me, you know that you're going to be working with me on a human basis. And you're going to learn that it's okay to be vulnerable. And that's scary for a lot of people. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to bring this into the house. What happens oftentimes in boardrooms translates into bedrooms. Yep. And so I would expect, I'm making an assumption here, that you, a lot of people you coach or some people you coach have those issues at home because even though the achievements are great in the corporate world, right, right. that there's a lack, there's not the balance in the personal world. Well, yeah, because, you know, let's face it, you're, you're in charge of big companies. You've got people who will jump at the snap of your finger and then you get home and your wife is upset with you because you left your socks on the floor. And you're like, I don't need this. Well, you do need it. And so helping these people learn how to communicate, learn how to deal with the idea that they have emotional, intimate needs is a really tricky place because I'm used to being powerful. I'm used to having people run to me and do whatever I want to. Why do I have to learn how to communicate? Well, Let's start with the fact that you're not feeling it. In here, you're not feeling it. That's why you want to do this. You can go buy another company. You can go buy another boat. But you're still going to come back to me with that feeling of, why isn't it enough? That's what we do. That's how we change, is we figure out what's here, and then we move out with the rest of that stuff. 
that to me is success. When you have those things in balance, when you've got that nice little merger going on between in here, out here, and you can handle it. You can handle anything. That is a good feeling. Give me a how-to. I am invulnerable in work, and I am crushing stuff. I have my emotional mask on. I am, ugh, I am Batman. And how do I take that mask off when I enter that door? You go in, and the one thing that you do every day is you go in and you find something nice to say to your partner. One thing. You know, we come in, we start talking about our day, we're mad because I can't find my phone. You know, we get real, we're internal focused, right? You come in and you go, okay, need to say something nice. I'm focusing on the other person. And for that person who probably has gotten accustomed to getting ignored now and then, it changes things. It softens things up. But you're not going overboard. You're not sitting down and saying, I have a moment where I need to cry with you. That may come later, but we don't start there. We start with the one small thing. You know, that reminds me of that Navy SEAL book that just make your bed. Start, you start each day by do, by, with an accomplishment, just make your bed. And that's a powerful takeaway right there. Because that yeah. door shows empathy, shows caring, and it's, it switches from all about you to all about them. That, that's a great takeaway. Your book is Creating the Life You Want to Live, From Average to Amazing in 30 Days. Now, how are you going to take me from this overachieving, <laughs> crazy, adrenaline junkie in business? <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'm going to tell you the same thing that I just said there. You're going to start with one thing. And this is what I tell people. You know, the reality is we don't go into amazement in 30 days. But you can amaze yourself by picking one thing to focus on for that 30 days. And this is what drives me crazy. You see this all the time too. January rolls around, everybody's gonna lose weight, everybody's gonna go to the gym, but they don't actually come up with a plan. There's just this loose idea. And when we have loose ideas, that's not a goal, that's a wish. And so creating a plan that is specific, that has numbers and dates and deadlines, that's what will help you take it from a wish to a goal, into action, into winning, to success. That one thing, just pick one thing. Now I've had people write to me and say, you helped me kick my eating too many almonds at night habit. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> you know, other people may not see that as a big accomplishment. This person, it was big enough to sit down and write to me. How cool is that? That's what we all want is that one thing. That one thing gets the ball rolling for everything. It's momentum. You made this sound easier than I am sure it actually is or was. Seven years in the trenches, doing the work, get your degree, and then it's France. All right, you moved to France. You got, how difficult? What was the biggest obstacle in that transition? You know. To be honest, I think the biggest obstacle was anticipating getting support from friends and family and not getting it. Because I was stepping so far out of my comfort zone that it made other people uncomfortable. And I didn't anticipate that. I should have, maybe, but I didn't. And so when people said, you're crazy, you can't do that, what are you thinking? Oh my God, you're leaving your mother. I mean, on and on and on. People had so many reasons why we should not do this. Their reasons. Their reasons. Their reasons for you. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you can listen to other people and you can let them stop you. But quite frankly, if you're not paying my bills at the end of the day, mm -hmm. not interested. Mm -hmm. Not interested. I think there's three types of, uh, of, of advice you get, right? One's from the well-intended. Yes. The, the others from the ill-intended, they really want to hurt you. And the others from the, from the misguided or uninformed. And sometimes they're all three, this is pretty much, the two of the three of the same, you know? So I am a rebel. So I don't run my life by consensus, but so many people go around and do a poll. What do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? And then we're subject to their projection of what it is we think we should do. And they run from a fear base and then we're just effed. Totally. That totally. So that, that was one of the parts. You, do you, you have to love this. We, we talked a little bit about this on, on the air. But your dream life 
is really living in France and, and doing what you do. I mean, you have created, you've worked to make that. You didn't yes. No, every now and then somebody will say, oh my God, you're so lucky you live in France. And I'm like, mm, luck really didn't have anything to do with this. Did you know this was very intentional? Very intentional. Here's the tough one. Here's the tough one. I think purpose comes from a pool. I think purpose comes when we're immersed in the work. And I think so many people are looking for their why that they end up all day long searching and searching without a flashlight in the dark. I think so. You've been pulled and you say every day when you're living your dream life, you should want to get up and live that gift and live the expression of that gift and be happy for the opportunity to open the, that gift every day. So how do we start doing that? Boy, I'm going to sound like a broken record here. You start with one thing. You start with one thing. You know, this is the thing. When you have a big idea, it's big and it feels big. Mm -hmm. When you break that big idea down, mm -hmm. you can do that one thing. But you can't do this. Mm -hmm. You start here, you move to here. So if I had just said, I'm going to close my practice and move to France, I would have stayed in a state of overwhelm. But, but well, what do I do? Do? do I sell the house first or do I get a visa first? I would have driven myself crazy and I may not have moved. And that's what a lot of people do is they stay in this place of overwhelm. I have a big dream. I support your big dream. Let's drill it down to how we can make it happen. And that's what people don't want to do. That's the hard work that a lot of people, they'd rather hold on to the dream yeah. up here than drill it down and start. Because when you start you get pretty damned uncomfortable. Mm, people don't like that. No. I love the state of overwhelm because you, you can stay in that state, I think, when frustration seeps in because you're not doing the first thing you need to do or the smaller things to realize the dream. But it's frustrating because you're not living the dream and you don't know how you just, you're not taking the first steps. And that's what will alleviate everything, right? <laughs> Ethiopian yeah. problem, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Well, exactly. And, and, you know, I had this client once who she had come into a massive amount of wealth. And so she was not working and she wanted to set up a nonprofit. And she had a very specific idea for this nonprofit. But each week she had a different reason why she couldn't move forward. Well, what were we dealing with? Fear. What if I get it wrong? What if it's not the right nonprofit? What if I don't put enough money in? What if I have a bad board? You know, fear, fear, fear. And when we stay stuck in that place of fear, you're always going to be overwhelmed because you don't have anything to hold on to, to go, I did that. I did that. I took my first step and I did it. So, which, 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 which is my segue to the importance of confidence and success. Ooh. Oh, confidence is something that I have a personal relationship with confidence because quite frankly, I grew up without any. And so I crafted a persona that from the outside looked really great. It looked like I had it all together, but inside, if I saw somebody coming down the street that I knew, I would literally cross the street out of fear that they wouldn't remember me. That's pretty sad. So I started building up my confidence by actually giving myself credit for what I was doing when I went to graduate school, I had two babies that were two and three at the time, single mom. That was pretty tough times. I learned to give myself credit for what I was doing instead of always looking at what I didn't get done that day or what I should have gotten done. I started focusing on what I actually did. And then I discovered I could feel pretty good about myself because I was actually getting things done and it felt better. And so this is what I ask people to look at all the time. What have you actually gotten done? Think about what you have been applauded for in your life. What would your best friend say about you? So these are the things that I think it's so important for all of us to keep in mind when we're striving to become more, when we're striving to, to grow, to be a better person. Now inquiring minds are writing to me and they want to know where they find you. So tell me where we can find you. You can find me at dreamanddial.com. I'm going to spell that because it's Dreama, D-R-E-M-A-D-I-A-L, dreamadial.com. 
I'm on Facebook, Dream a Dial PhD. I'm on Instagram, Dream a Dial. I'm on Twitter, Dream a Dial PhD. I'm all around on social media because I, I love the connection. I know that right now Facebook is really under fire. But, you know, I've connected with so many people on Facebook that I never would have met otherwise. And I love the connection there. It's just great.